Good evening. I'm Victor Malarek. We've all recoiled in horror at the images of the dead and dying children of Somalia. It's an appalling and all too familiar litany of famine and starvation. But it's played out against the background of tribal warfare and cold-blooded Cold War politics. Tonight, in a special full edition program, we're going to show you how and why Somalia has become the latest hell on earth and how some of the men responsible for that hell have managed to escape to Canada. They are the men who served Somalia's deposed dictator, Siad Barre, and helped him brutalize a nation while most of the world looked the other way. In the next hour, we'll reveal their secret escape routes through the United States, and we'll document how unprepared the Canadian government is to deal with men who stand accused of crimes against humanity. It's a story some people don't want you to see. In a forgotten corner of northern Somalia, this place is called the Valley of Death. The remains of 7,000 children, women and men lie where they fell, mowed down by Somali government troops four years ago. It was one of Africa's bloodiest civil wars. In the fields nearby, instead of harvesting badly needed food, brigades of boys called young pioneers dig up a deadly crop. Landmines. This week alone, they found 200. And all too often, the mines explode without warning. And all too often, there are victims. 57 casualties just in this hospital. It's the children who hurt the most. Eight-year-old Awil was tending goats when a landmine blew off his hand and left him blind. Blind tribal hatred has left Somalia in ruins. The people of the north, from a clan called the Isaks, became targets of a war waged by a dictator, Siad Bari. He was from the south, a member of a clan called the Darads. In the end, all Somalis suffered at the hands of Siad Bari. The luckiest ones fled to refugee camps like this one in Ethiopia, and even as far away as Canada. About 30,000 Somalis have come since the fighting began, but the victims have not entirely escaped their persecutors. Two years ago, Abdi Ali Nur Mohammed came to Canada as a refugee, claiming he was persecuted in Somalia. But back home, he's known as Judge Ali Noor. He sentenced dozens of people to death. This man, he was a murderer. Like he was a killer. He was a dangerous man. Not far away from Judge Noor, another of Barry's men, Mohammed Hassan Ismail Farah. He also arrived in Canada two years ago as a refugee. But high school students held in these military cells remember him as the police lieutenant colonel who brutally interrogated them. He tortured me by himself. I was sentenced to death. And they put me in a jail. I was being tortured like electrical shocks. Beating. And this man, the most feared of Barry's men in Canada, Yusuf Abdi Ali Toke, another refugee claimant. He works as a security guard in Toronto. Back in Somalia, he wore a different uniform as one of Barry's military commanders. In the tiny village of Gebile, people say he maimed, tortured, and terrorized them and had more than a hundred people executed. Goad Muse escaped from Gibile and made it to Canada. This man put human beings into a blazing fire. He made vehicles run over other people. I cannot understand how a government with respect for human rights can give protection to such a man. Protection or not, the presence of Barry's men has ignited clan tensions in Canada. Torture me. There are those people who torture you. And take Many care. Somalis here remain bitterly divided along clan lines. We asked to meet with victims of torture. 
Instead, Somalis from several clans came. Each one wants to the problem of Somalia. The meeting exploded into a shouting match between those Somalis who want to forget the past and those who can't forget. The Siadra army came. They opened fire indiscriminately. I saw so many classmates dying in front of me. They torture us. They keep us in a military place. And whenever I remember my friends dying in front of me, it keeps me. It keeps me. Uh, I can't I can, I can, I can even talk to, to that situation now. There shouldn't be any witch hunt, you know, as is, uh, has been going on, you know, for the Nazis, you know. I think we are Somalis. We need to be for, forgive and forget. History repeats itself. If we don't take a stand now and condemn it, what happened in the time of Siad Barre will come back again. Since the time of the pharaohs, Somalia has been coveted by foreign powers. Not for any natural resources. It is, after all, mostly hot, harsh desert, where nomads wander in search of food and water, but coveted for its strategic location. Somalia's tragedy is rooted in where it sits, on the tip of the Horn of Africa. Foreign powers saw valuable trade routes straddling the desert, deep water ports on the Indian Ocean, and in this century, a staging point to supply and protect the oil fields of the Persian Gulf. The British, the Italians, and the French all marched through, playing on clan rivalries. Then the Soviets and the Americans began playing superpower politics with their favorite dictators. Frank Kriegler, former U.S. ambassador to Somalia doesn't hesitate to say so. Somalia became a sort of ping-pong ball between the two sides in, in a Cold War confrontation. Um, the victim in all of this, of course, were the Somali people themselves, most of whom did not benefit in any way from that Cold War competition between the two sides. One man who did benefit was General Siad Bari. In 1969, he overthrew a weak democracy set up a military dictatorship, and started playing superpower ping-pong. Barry's neighbor, Ethiopia's Emperor Haile Selassie, was backed by the West in the 1970s. So not surprisingly, Barry was embraced by the Soviets. But when Selassie was overthrown by a communist dictator, ping-pong politics forced the Americans to court a new ally, Somalia's strongman, Siad Barry. Barry cared little about cutting old ties and switching alliances. As long as someone supplied him with weapons, he'd have the power to do whatever he wanted to his people. He ruled from Mogadishu, his capital in the south, favoring his own clan, the Darads. Barry had some Isaks in top positions, including the notorious head of the prison system. But that didn't stop him from trying to crush Isak nationalism in the north. The international media did not show up en masse for the slaughter of the Isaks. Barry's atrocities were largely ignored, but Isak artists captured their plight. All-out civil war eventually erupted in 1988, when a mainly Isak resistance group called the Somali National Movement, the SNM, briefly seized Hargeisa and other towns. Barry ordered Soviet MiG jets and American-built tanks to level the cities. But it wasn't enough to save his regime. In January of last year, Barry fled to Kenya. His bodyguards gunned down and left to rot outside the presidential palace. In the north, the Isaks inherited a dying land. In Hargeisa, once home to a half million people, 50,000 were killed. They were subjected to artillery shelling, to bombing, to house-to-house -house killings. And even after they fled their homes, they were subjected to straving and c continued artillery shelling. Rakia Omar was born in Hargeisa, but left as a teenager. 
As head of the New York-based human rights group, Africa Watch, she tried to alert the Western world to Barry's atrocities, a country where justice was a sham. We documented cases where people were sentenced to life imprisonment simply under a tree. There's no investigation, there's no legal defense. So I wouldn't actually go so far as to call it a trial. It was just some kind of facade that they wanted to go through to show that they were using at least a military form of justice. But it was just pure might, as simple as that. The might of military courts, police torturers, and massacres carried out by army commanders kept Barry in power for 21 years. The might of men like this judge, this police interrogator, and this army colonel, all now in Canada. Judge Abdi Ali Noor was the first Barry official to get here. He arrived in June 1990, six months before the Barry regime collapsed. Noor made it first to New York City. Then he drove to this border crossing at Fort Erie, Ontario. Noor had no trouble with Canadian immigration. In his refugee application, he said he had a falling out with the Barry regime in May 1988 and was jailed and tortured because he refused to sentence a group of Isak elders to death. That may well be true, but he left out some important details. For at least 15 months, Judge Noor held court on the second floor of this police station in Hargeza. He was not an ordinary judge. He was chairman of the military court. With a stroke of his pen, Judge Noor signed these execution orders, sentencing people to death for what the Barry regime called anti-state activities. Those condemned were sometimes dragged right out of his courtroom to this yard below and shot on the spot. Other victims of Noor's swift justice were brought to this mountainside outside Hargeisa, lined up before a firing squad and executed. Often the victims were little more than teenagers. Among Noor's victims, Hadar Hussein, one of many young sympathizers of the Somali national movement. He was arrested in the middle of the night. His brother Malid escaped to Canada. He remembers what his father told him on the steps of Noor's courthouse. You are not going to see your brother again because he's going to die. And you know, while he was saying that to me, the judge came out, this guy, Abdi Ali Noor, and then he pointed his hand to him and he said, that's the man. Who, I mean, who ordered your brother to get, like, who ordered your brother to get killed? Noor lives in his high-rise on Weston Road in Toronto with his wife and two children. He refused our repeated requests for an interview. His lawyer also declined. He was found to be a credible refugee at his preliminary hearing on September 19, 1990. The next month, he received his work permit. A second Barry official in Canada was one of his senior police officers in the Criminal Investigations Department. Mohammed Hassan Ismail Farah arrived in November 1991. He told immigration officials he was with the Somali anti-drug squad for 17 years. In Somalia, Farah was a police officer, but his war was against dissidents, not drugs. In 1984, Barry arrested hundreds of high school students for protesting against his regime. Seven boys were taken here to these military barracks in Hargeza and were sentenced to death. They broke into our house at night. I was pulled from my bed and taken to a place near the military headquarters. Farah was in charge. Abdi Mohammed Ismail was one of those boys. Now in London, England, he never forgot what Farah did to him. He took pliers to take out my tooth. He said, if you don't answer all our questions, we will pull out all your teeth. Then he pulled the other tooth, and I lost consciousness. Ismail had no trouble recognizing his torturer. Yes. This one. Another of the seven condemned teenagers now lives in Toronto, not far from his torturer. Yusuf Mohammed Isse was 15 when he faced Farah in a jail cell. What kind of ways were you tortured? They tied me up like this. They put my hands and my legs together and I was tied up at least. 24 hours and they hit me something I felt 
like a bed of the rifle on my cheek. Is this the man who tortured you? Yes, he's Muhammad Hassan Farah. Only a worldwide campaign by Amnesty International saved Yusuf, Ismail, and four other boys from the firing squad. The seventh was executed. Farah wouldn't be interviewed. His lawyer says Farah was not in Somalia in the summer of 1984 when the students were tortured. Farah also told immigration officials his wife and two children are still in Somalia. But we spotted them with him in Toronto. His wife arrived here as a refugee a full year before Farah did. Despite these discrepancies in his story, Farah got to stay. He was declared a credible refugee last January and got his work permit a month later. But of all of Barry's men in Canada, this army commander is the most feared and hated. Colonel Yusuf Abdi Ali Toke entered Canada on December 21st, 1990. Our search for his story took us to the small Isak village of Gibili in northern Somalia. Toke, as he was commonly known, commanded Barry's troops here in 1987 and 1988. One of the men under his command was Captain Mohammed Nur Farah. He says Toke had at least 120 villagers executed on this hillside. He remembers one morning, March 14, 1988. Where was, where was the firing squad? At the time, the captain was one of the few ISACs left in the local army command. He was ordered to witness the shootings. You can still see the evidence of the killings. People would be tied to these poles and shot dead. Their bodies dumped in unmarked graves. How many people were killed that day? 18 people were killed. Who gave the orders to fire? Toke did. Today, the people of Kabili are literally turning swords into plowshares. The remnants of tanks and artillery shells are pounded into ladles. But there are plenty of reminders of Toke's reign here. And everyone has a story to tell a visitor from Canada. Two men were caught, tied to a tree. Oil was poured on them, and they were burned alive. I saw it with my own eyes. I cut away their remains. He caught my brother. You tied him to a military vehicle and dragged him behind. He said to us, if you've got enough power, get him back. He shredded him into pieces. That's how he died. Did you see Toke do that with your own eyes? Yes, and there are many people around who saw it. And everyone knows where Colonel Toke has run. Canada. Canada. We want him brought back here to face trial. But Yusuf Abdi Ali Toke is about as far away from facing trial in Gabile as he can get. Every afternoon he drives to work at this truck leasing company in West Toronto. He's traded in his army fatigues for a burned security guard uniform. In February 1991, his refugee claim was found to be credible. He got his Canadian work permit on October 8, 1991. When we approached him one afternoon, Yusuf Toke was not eager to talk to us. I'd like to talk to you about your days as a military commander in Somalia. Sir, there have been some very serious allegations made about you by people in Gibele. Many legitimate Somali refugees find it frightening that Barry's men are living in this country. Ahmed Samatar heads a largely ESAC group that wants Barry's men out of Canada. For the Somali refugees, Canada is getting unsafe for them. They see the very same people who have tortured them in the subway. Women are seeing people who have tortured them and, and raped them. We don't want to deal 40 years later like what happened in the Second World War. Uh, ones are fresh now. Here are the war criminals and the victims are here. We have to stop it. I don't think any Canadian, any public Canadian, want to have a neighbor who was a war criminal who had committed crimes against humanity. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But there are Somalis in Canada who defend Barry's men, mainly people from Barry's own clan, the Darads. A few days before this broadcast, they called a news conference to denounce our investigation as biased. They warn it will trigger civil war among Somalis by stirring up tribal hatreds. We would like to express our deep dismay and concern 
Hassan Omar of the Somali Canadian Association of Etobicoke knows about Army Commander Toke and Judge Ali Noor. I can assure you that they were military officials, one was military and one was his, I mean, judge, and they were doing their job when they were there. And they are, and I, I was satisfied what they were telling me. And you believe they're innocent? And I believe that they're innocent. Were there any human rights abuses committed under Barry? Not that I'm aware of. You're saying that you're not aware of any human rights abuses under the Barry regime? In, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, the, human, the way that the West probably might think about uh, human rights uh, can activities I mean, against human rights is not considered back in Somalia as a human right. Our interview with Omar was cut short, and outside, angry Somalis expressed their views. Well, as far as we're concerned, you people are bringing problems for us. You're bringing problems. Listen, my friend, there's violence between We don't want no violence. She wants to be interviewed. No. Shut the fuck up. We don't want to interview with CBC. Later, our Somali researcher received a death threat from a man identifying himself as a member of Army Commander Toke's clan. Rest assured, the anonymous caller said, that you are going to die because of the Toke affair. You and those who are helping you, this is a promise. Four days ago, Yusuf Toke finally agreed to be interviewed. The story you have got is completely, entirely, perfectly, and absolutely partial. It's false, totally baseless. We went to a town called, a village called Gibile, and people there, villagers there, told us that you and your men terrorized them, maimed them, had executions taking place all over the place. All I can say to you, I can't do that to my people. That's false, that's untrue. If I have never did anything wrong to any Somali. A captain under your command in Gabili said that he was with you when your men went up to a hillside and executed more than a hundred people. Let him go to the court. That's false. I have never did that. I tell you that. I have never did that. That's his... I have never did I'm innocent. And I'm confident of myself. Thank you for, very much for giving me the opportunity. But there was a man who told us that he witnessed you and your men burning two people alive, that you were there. They let him go to the court. That's false. That's, false. Said That's that all she, what I'm telling you. A woman Thank said you that very you much. had tied her, man, her brother to the back of an armored vehicle and shredded him to bits. That's all lie. Go to Las Ano, then listen what they, what they say to tell you, or Boreme. Why don't you go to Boreme? You didn't. You were a commander in Gibile. That's where we went. <laughs> Judge Ali Noor, police interrogator Farah, and Army Commander Toke are among a dozen of Siad Barry's officials, friends, and relatives now living in Canada. Even Barry's eldest son, Ali Mohammed Siad, a colonel in his father's army, found a new home here. When we return, we'll examine how they made it into Canada through the United States. A merry-go-round. Somali style. For two decades, Somalia was the playground of the superpowers. Today, the battered and shell-shocked roads of the country are littered with the wreckage of the Cold War. Where once the superpowers jockeyed for supremacy, the only Soviet American competition now is for parking space on the desert sand. After his coup in 1969, Siad Barry set up a Soviet-style one-party state. That brought not only cheers from visiting Soviet military advisors, it also meant weapons and training for Barry's men. Men like Colonel Yusuf Abdi Ali Toke. He went to an Odessa military training school from 1975 to 1977, where he became fluent in Russian. But in 1977, Barry made a big mistake. He went to war against neighboring Ethiopia, another Soviet client. The Soviets gave Barry the boot and backed the more powerful Ethiopian dictator, Mengistu Haile Marian. Spurned by the evil empire, Barry eventually found a new friend in Washington. Barry had something the Americans wanted, a strategic naval base and airstrip close to the oil-rich Persian Gulf. 
The Americans shipped in $150 million worth of military hardware, plus military advisors and military training for Barry's men. One of the men President Ronald Reagan sent to Somalia to protect American interests was Ambassador Frank Kriegler. Siad Barry has been called one of Africa's worst, most brutal dictators. Well, I would have to agree with that assessment. Uh, certainly one of the most brutal and uh, certainly qualified himself as being one of Africa's most ruthless dictators. Why didn't you just say to Siad Barry, we don't want you? We supported him essentially at that time for strategic reasons because it was valuable to have backup access to military facilities if they became needed. Backup access. That meant it was now America's turn to train Barry's men under a special Pentagon program called IMET, International Military Education. It is one of the few opportunities in the year for us all to get our boots muddy as we experience a little hands-on training. This U.S. Army video shows the IMET school at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Between 1982 and 1988, more than 300 Somali officers got their boots muddy at a cost of almost $7 million. Did the training involve armed combat infantry? Yes, it did. Laying of landmines? It might well have. Counterinsurgency? Certainly. These are professional concerns of military officers everywhere. But how could the United States train officers for a regime that's internationally known as repugnant? I'm willing to bet that thanks to an exposure of several months in the United States at military bases or military camps in the United States, those exposures almost surely will have produced a, a, a better, less abusive, less repressive grade of military officer than those who didn't get it. One of the graduates from the Fort Leavenworth class of 86 was that former Soviet pupil, Yusuf Abdi Ali Toke. He trained in the U.S. for two years before returning to terrorize villagers in northern Somalia. I'd call him a rotten apple. I don't know the case. I don't know anything of him. But certainly there were cases of brutality by individual military officers. If some of those cases were carried on by officers who had had IMET training, it's entirely possible. It was only after human rights groups exposed Barry's systematic slaughter of tens of thousands of ESACs that the American Congress pressured the Pentagon to cut off the sale of lethal weapons. 1,200 M16 rifles. But this video from a U.S. congressional investigation reported that arms worth $1.4 million still slipped through. The shipment arrived at a critical point in the fighting and was distributed to troops in the north. It was the, the last drops out of the pipeline of lethal weapons, and it was not a large shipment. Those guns were used by C. Ed Berry against his own people. What is the Army supposed to do except to defend itself? It did defend itself. The problem was it defended itself to an extreme. This was a war, a civil war, going on between armed combatants, and people get killed. But the U.S. picked signs. The U.S. was already identified with the government. It didn't pick sides. It was with the government. And the U.S. was with the Barry government to the end. Ever aware of Somalia's strategic value, in 1989, Ambassador Kriegler was on hand when General Norman Schwarzkopf, soon to be the hero of the Persian Gulf War, came calling on his Somali military partners. Ambassador Kriegler ended his tour of duty in 1990, but not before toasting Barry's officers at a farewell party. It's been a great satisfaction to me to be able to fly the American flag in a cooperative relationship with the Somali military. Nine months later, the Americans were hastily evacuating their embassy in Mogadishu. It was January 1991, and Barry's regime was collapsing as his American patrons were preoccupied with their war against Iraq. This home video shows Kriegler's successor, Ambassador James Bishop, explaining to Somalis at the embassy why they couldn't leave with the fleeing Americans. I regret that under international law we can't be evacuating citizens of this country. But some Somalis had an escape ticket, a stamp in their passport authorizing them to travel to the U.S., supposedly as a tourist. Many refugees fleeing Barry's regime used these visas to get to North America. 
but so did Barry's men. Judge Noor came to Canada through the U.S. Police interrogator Farah spent seven months in the States. Army Commander Toke was back in the U.S. for more training at an Air Force base in Mississippi for five months in 1990, before he crossed into Canada. James Bishop, the last U.S. ambassador to Somalia, now works for the State Department's Bureau of Human Rights. There was no rap line, no organized escape route to get known war criminals or bad guys to safety out of Somalia. It's an absurd question. I won't even answer it. Do you feel in any way responsible for some of Barry's top men being able to escape to Canada? None whatsoever. I was never aware that we issued a visa to anyone who had engaged in any criminal form of activity. The U.S. is known for its intelligence gathering around the world. You must have known who some of the war criminals were who committed some of these atrocities. There were thousands of people who were killed by the Siad Barre government. We don't know the names of the sergeants, of the captains, of the lieutenants who uh, were responsible for shooting those people at Hargeza or elsewhere in northern Somalia. I find that difficult to believe. Rakia Omar of Africa Watch. These are notorious um, uh, human rights abusers. And it just, it's, I find it difficult that they would just walk into the United States Embassy in Mogadishu anywhere from 1988 onwards, and they wouldn't know who these people were. If they didn't know, they should have known. There must have been warning signals put up in the embassy saying, you've got to watch out for who you're giving those visas to. Well, if anybody came in with a sign around his neck that said, uh, I've tortured 49 people, he wouldn't have got a visa. But nobody came in with a sign around his neck that said, I tortured 49 people. What are you talking about? L taking a close look at people. Yes. People don't come in and advertise the fact that they have engaged in atrocious behavior. The collapse of the Siabera regime was, uh, was evident for at least 18 months before it happened. And uh, if the U.S. really wanted to make sure that it would have no more Somali blood on its hands, it should, it should have, and it may well have kept a dossier of all these people, and it should have ensured that they would not be granted any visas at any U.S. embassy. That clearly didn't happen. It must have become obvious to people at the American embassy in Mogadishu that many of Barry's men with blood on their hands are going to be rushing there saying, can I have a visa? I never saw anyone come to the embassy with blood on his hands. But there was plenty of blood on the streets. An already brutalized Somalia splintered into clan-based fiefdoms. In northern Somalia, the Isaks broke away and set up their own independent Republic of Somaliland in May 1991 under the leadership of the SNM, the Somali National Movement. But the SNM has a shaky hold on power. Gangs of armed youths patrol the streets, and it has been accused of vengeful reprisals against hundreds of civilians. In the south, remnants of Barry's army and rival warlords from other clans fought for power, well stocked with the weapons the Americans and the Soviets left behind. And then, the ultimate horror of Barry's legacy. In his final years in power, Barry's soldiers plundered crops and seed grains. Once ousted, his loyal troops invaded the south three times from Kenya and destroyed irrigation systems. Bandits from other clans ransacked the capital, Mogadishu. It all added up this summer to mass starvation and famine for millions of Somalis from all tribes. Out of the horrors of Somalia, thousands of refugees fled to Canada. Barry's men knew this would be the perfect place to hide. Former American ambassador Frank Kriegler. The word had circulated among all Somalis that Toronto, Vancouver, these were the, the, the land of tomorrow for Somalis. These were, this, was, this was a country that was welcoming the victims of repression with open arms. When the tables turned, it's no surprise to me that the former uh, perpetrators of the repression 
had very much in their minds the reputation of Canada as a haven for people on the land. You get your stuff and uh, it's just through the door here. And... Barry's men knew it was a lot easier to get accepted as a refugee here than in the States. Declaring yourself a Somali is virtually a guaranteed ticket into Canada. More than 90% of Somali refugee claims are accepted. And Barry's men knew it would be easy to hide their past by mixing in with the real refugees. As refugees flood across the border, their names are fed into computers. But according to our sources, none of Barry's men appear on any lookout list. So officials have no way of knowing who is coming in. Abdi Ali Noor gave his real name, said he was a military judge, and got in. Mohammed Hassan Ishmael Farah used his real name, said he was a senior police officer, and also got in. Yusuf Abdi Ali Toke used his real name, said he was a military commander, and he walked right in. Canada's immigration policy is symbolic of the country itself. Last June, Bernard Valcour, Canada's immigration minister, proposed sweeping changes to Canada's Immigration Act. One amendment would give border officials the power to refuse entry to any senior official of a government that engaged in gross human rights violations or war crimes. But Canadian authorities would still have to know the identities of the war criminals to stop them. Are you aware of the presence of men accused of committing war crimes in Somalia now here in Canada? Yes, we are. You're saying that potential war criminals can slip through the cracks and remain in Canada? Absolutely. Absolutely. Potential war criminals, we all know that they've slipped through the crack and that they are slipping through the crack. But with the history that we've had with war criminals, you would have thought that we've filled in the cracks long ago. There is no uh, advanced list, okay, with people saying, hey, hey, I'm a war criminal. No one brags about being a war criminal. And it's not on your passport. But there was a brutal dictator in place for years in Somalia who sent us the victims of his persecution. Absolutely, you're right. And his regime is falling. Yep. Was there no warning in the immigration department through external affairs or whatever saying, watch it, we may get some of these guys now? I can't prevent those people from coming here. I know something, however. Eventually, we'll find out and then they'll suffer the consequences of having defrauded Canada, and they'll be out. But that may take a long time. When we return, the battle to get rid of Barry's men in Canada. His name alone should have been a dead giveaway. He's the eldest son of General Siad Barry and a colonel in his father's army. Ali Mohammed Siad Barry came here July 1st, 1991. Ali Mohammed Siad had no trouble getting into Canada. He flew to Seattle, Washington, and then took a taxi all the way to this border crossing in British Columbia, a $200 cab fare. He gave his real name and told immigration officers he was the son of the deposed president of Somalia. Oddly enough, that didn't trigger any alarm bells. Ali Mohammed Siad settled on a quiet street in Vancouver, renting a basement apartment. He was declared to be a credible refugee and everything 